Tonight, if you have your Bible and would like to turn to a good beginning, it will be in the 25th chapter of the book of Exodus. Tonight, we want to look at the question, why did God give the instructions for building the tabernacle? And why is this so important? And it is important. A great deal of attention has been given to the Ten Commandments finest statement, of course, of an ethical code, a moral code that's ever been given. And yet God took one chapter to give the Ten Commandments, and when he was giving the tabernacle, he began in chapter 25, and he went all the way through the book of Exodus, through the 40th chapter, from chapter 25 through 40. It's all about instructions for the making of of a tabernacle, and in one sense, it's very boring. The only ones I could see would be interested in that section would be architects and contractors, because it's just like a blueprint. It tells you the measurements of the tabernacle. And God gave a great deal of attention to that, and then he gave an entire book for the service of that tabernacle, and that's the book of Leviticus. And that tabernacle became the very center of the life of the people. Now, it's when they became a nation and they left the land of Egypt. Interesting, recently they've been going toward Egypt, but then they were anxious to get out of Egypt. And they crossed over, followed more or less this route here, and they came down to Mount Sinai. And here is where God gave to them what is known as the Mosaic system. Now, the heart of that Mosaic system is the tabernacle. And from here on, they had the tabernacle. It became the center of their worship. And I'd like for you to see this because it always remained the center of the life of the nation. When they were in the wilderness, they camped in respect to the tabernacle. Always it was at the very center. And when they moved, and they always moved eastward, that is, they pitched the tabernacle always eastward, and Moses and Aaron were out in front, but the tribe of Judah was the tribe that led, and those three were on the east side. I don't care to go into detail tonight of this, but just for you to notice the relationship of the tribes around the tabernacle, and then the tribe of Levi, of course, that had the service of the tabernacle, the book of Leviticus comes from the tribe of Levi. Well, they were about this, and there were the three families, the Gershonites, Merariites, and Kohathites. They are the ones that tended the tabernacle, carried it on the wilderness march, and this is their relationship. Now, when they came into the land, the tabernacle was first put up at Shiloh, and that's where Samuel ministered. That was his headquarters. But when David became king, David wanted a center, a capital, and of course to him Jerusalem was that place. And in Jerusalem, why he laid the plans, and it ought to be called David's temple, not Solomon's temple. Solomon, I don't think, had much of a heart for it. David did have a heart for it, and it was David's idea to build God a house. And into that went the furniture of the tabernacle, and the temple supplanted the tabernacle. Now, the temple was rather complicated, and it was ornate. It was a regular jewel. It's conservatively estimated that $5 million went into it. Others estimate that $15 million went into it. Of course, in this day, why, that's not much, but back in those days, that was a great deal. And, of course, into the tabernacle itself, there evidently was poured in over a million dollars, conservatively speaking. But, again, there are those that think it was five million. Now, let me bring the tabernacle. This was in the very center of the camp. And I think the first thing that we need to note is the instructions now for bringing together the material and to answer a few questions. You'll notice the material they had. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly 
with his heart ye shall take my offering. Now, God has always insisted that an offering be a willing sacrifice. Now, when the tithe was added, it actually was a tax. We today fail to see that. And I personally believe there were three tithes that were collected of the people. They paid high taxes in that day. And the tithe was more of a tax. And above that is what they gave. You only gave to God willingly. And that's true today. God has made it very clear in any age. And even back under the law, the tithe was a tax, demanded. And God's offerings are never demanded. He says, I want you to bring this offering willingly. With his heart ye shall take my offering. And this is the offering which ye shall take of them. Notice what the type of material they are to bring. Gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet. Notice the colors, blue and purple and scarlet. And those colors predominated together with the gold color, of course. And fine linen and goat's hair and ram skins dyed red and badger skins and chittim wood, oil for the light, spices for anointing oil and for sweet incense, onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. And those were precious stones, by the way. Now, the question arises, where did these people, just out of slavery, get all of this wealth? Well, if you go back and read in the book of Exodus, our translation says they spoil the Egyptian. And that's not recently we're talking about. They spoil the Egyptian. That has to do with when they came out of slavery. Now, when they came out of slavery, you will recall that they didn't rob them. That's not the thought. What they did, they had been in slavery for 400 years. They collected back wages. That's what they got. And that amounted to a great deal. When they left Egypt, they left with tremendous wealth. The children of Israel did. They came in there with wealth, and they came out with wealth. And this is the place where the material came from. Now, that, I hope, answers one question. And then there is something else. People just fresh out of slavery and have just recently accumulated a little, the question arises, well, they're not apt to give generously, like the members of the church of the open door are the fundamental people today. They don't give like that. May I say to you, this is the most amazing offering that I ever heard that was ever taken. In the 36th chapter of Exodus, verse 5, will you listen to this? I can hardly believe it. And they spake unto Moses, saying, the people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded to make. A free will offering taken of slaves, and it's more than enough. Now listen to Moses. I want to tell you, we couldn't use him on the staff of the Church of the Open Door. Listen to Moses. And Moses gave commandment, and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp, saying, Let neither man nor woman make any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from bringing. Did you ever hear of that before? Or sent? We've never had that experience at the Church of the Open Door. I'm of the opinion that if some Sunday morning Dr. Cole or myself got up here and said, Friends, you've given too much. We just won't receive an offering today. We'd have several heart cases here. We'd have to take them out in stretchers, I tell you. But it would be wonderful, and I'm being facetious, but wouldn't it be wonderful if God's people gave like that? We sometimes hear today, Oh, the church is continually talking about money. The preacher talks about money. Well, my friend, you know why he does? Because the man in the pew is not giving. Now, Moses said, we've got enough. Don't bring any more. 
That is one of the most amazing things that you'll read. And that's one reason that I'm always reluctant to criticize the Israelites just out of slavery, because these people were really giving to the Lord. Now, it's this kind of material that was used in the construction of the tabernacle. Now, will you notice, and we want to just see the overall program here this evening, this was the outer court, and I won't go into detail, yet I should say it's 100 cubits by 50 cubits, 100 by 50. I'm trying to get it into feet, 75 by 150 feet. And this is 30 by 10, and then it's 10 high. And then over it were these coverings, lovely coverings. And in the tabernacle were seven articles of furniture. This probably will get it before you in a little bit better way. There were the three sections, the outer court, the holy place, the holy of holies, two articles of furniture in the outer court, three in the holy place, and two inside the holy of holies. Looks like one, but the mercy seat was a cover for the box. So that this was the tabernacle that was built. And the gold went into all of the articles of furniture in the holy place and the holy of holies. These out here were made of brass, and we'll see why when we take that up. And the boards and bars that we look at next time actually was the framework for the tabernacle itself. And the pillars and the capitals, we'll look at them also. They rested in sockets. They fitted down, and there were gold sockets, there were brazen sockets, there were silver sockets, and they were solid, evidently very heavy. And you must remember, they were carried on the wilderness march. And this was the tabernacle proper. So a great deal of wealth went into it. Probably we can see the tabernacle proper here just a little bit better. Those were golden bars and boards that were used in there. We'll be looking at that next time. And this, again, is the covering that went over the tabernacle. It protected it. I've never felt that it had this on it. I see so many pictures like that today, but that's not my idea of it at all. And these are some of close-ups of the articles of furniture that we'll be dealing with. And we'll deal with the articles of furniture on Sunday nights here. There, again, is the brazen altar. And this is the brazen laver that is here, and a better picture of it is here. These give you some conception of what went into the tabernacle. Inside was three articles. One was the golden lampstand, and inside the Holy of Holies was the ark. And the ark was of gold, that is, acacia wood covered with gold, inside and out. And on top was a highly ornamented cover called the mercy seat. Nothing in the world but a top for the box, but highly ornamented with the two cherubims beams that were there. Now, that is what you have in the tabernacle. Now, we want tonight to answer very briefly the question, why did God give the instructions for the tabernacle? Why did he do it? Well, may I say this, that the Word of God reveals that God wants fellowship with man, the creature that he created. And the reason that he created you and the reason that he created the human family was to have fellowship with him. And to have fellowship with him entails certain considerations, and one, of course, that that creature be a free moral agent. God didn't want a yes man. God wanted him in fellowship, but he didn't want him to be just a robot yes man. No one likes that around. That is the thing that have caused a great many men that have been great men that have fallen. They've had too many yes men around them. And the yes man told them what they wanted to hear and didn't tell them the truth. Hitler got bad advice, very bad advice. They told him what he wanted to hear, and it was unfortunate. He made quite a few blunders. The Tsar of Russia had that around him. And Napoleon, you remember one time, rebuked his staff. They gave him the advice to go on into battle. And he said, wait a minute, you know that it's not wisdom to go into battle. And I don't intend to, but I just wanted to see what you'd say. 
And I think you fellows are just agreeing with me. And I don't want that. Then when he went toward Warsaw, his staff rebuked him. They told him, they said, look, we think you're making a mistake uh, going into Russia. And he did not listen to them. And of course, that was the defeat of Napoleon. And God wants fellowship. But he wants that fellowship to be from a free moral agent who chooses God. Now, that is the creature that God created in the Garden of Eden. Now, notice what it says. In Genesis 1:27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. That's very important. Then over in the third chapter, verse 8, you'll notice this. God created man now in the image of God. Why? Well, here's a creature that can answer back to me. I can bestow my love and affection on him, and he can respond with his love and affection. Now, that is, for God, the most wonderful thing in the world, and that is for mankind the most wonderful thing in the world. How tragic our churches have become today, a place where nothing but criticism, instead of being a place where there's an expression of love and then a response of love. That's what the church ought to be. I ought not to detour, but maybe this might be worthwhile. But when I was up in the San Francisco area, I went around to look at these hippies up there, and I want to say this, that I haven't changed my viewpoint, but my heart goes out to them. I feel sorry for them. I talked to a young boy. He asked me for 25 cents. Little scraggly beard, dirty. You could smell him a block. And he said to me, would you give me 25 cents? And I said, no, I won't give you 25 cents. But I said, I'd like to know what your viewpoint is. Why have you come here? And why are you out here begging? Well, he was disappointed. He came up there. There was to be free food free marijuana, free LSD, free love, free everything. And he said, nothing's free. And he's greatly disappointed. He would go home. He lived down in the San Joaquin Valley in a little town. He said, I'd go home. He was shamed to a court. And I told him, I said, the way you look, boy, I'd be ashamed to go home too. But if I were you, I'd clean up and shave up, look like a man and act like a man and go home. I said, you're in the wrong direction. I tried to talk to him about the Lord, but he wouldn't listen. Now, they're in rebellion. They're in rebellion against religion. They're in rebellion against society. But do you know what they call themselves? The little flower people. And do you know what they have love in? And do you know why they are having love ends? Now, let's face it, because we don't have love ends. And they haven't found love in their homes. That's what's the matter today. The church, you see. Now, God created man. God wanted to bestow all of his love upon this creature and have that creature respond. But that creature's got to do it, be a free moral agent. But that creature failed. And we read in verse 8 of chapter 3, it's tragic. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Now, we feel sorry for man, and rightly so. He's in rebellion against God now, running away from God. But have you ever stopped to feel sorry for God? (laughs) God had come down apparently in the cool of every day. And I think up to this day, man had come, Adam and Eve had come, and oh, we found something new today. Oh, we thank you for it. How good you are. You've given us everything, and we thank you for it. And then God bestowed more love upon them, and they respond. It must have been wonderful, the fellowship that this creature had with his Creator. But now this day comes, and God comes. God knows what's happened. But God is following now through to reach this man. He comes into the garden. Be no fellowship today. God is holy. Man is now in rebellion against God, and when any creature sets its will against the will of God, that's sin. And I don't care how the theologians 
classified. It's sin. Any creature puts its will against the will of the Creator. And so this man now is in rebellion against God. And what does God do? God calls for him. And God searches for the man. Adam, where are you? Why is God looking for him? Because God wants to restore fellowship. Now, there must be righteous ground on which a holy God can meet with a sinner and have fellowship with him. And my friend, the tabernacle was that place. So God and man must meet on righteous ground. And in the tabernacle, there was an altar And it was called the brazen altar or the burnt altar because on it were sacrifices made for sin. They recognized two things. First, man was a sinner. And second, that this little animal is picturing a sacrifice God will make someday for sin. And that is a message that God had to get over to man. And he gave him the tabernacle for that reason. Do you notice back here in the 25th of Exodus, right where I stopped reading, I did not read that next verse. And now I think I should read it. If we're proper, we'll read it. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. God says, make a place where I can meet with man. And the tabernacle... It's the only place. Now, God never said, gather around the Ten Commandments and I'll meet with you there. Inside the Holy of Holies, in that box, the ark, was the Ten Commandments, but they were covered with blood. It had been broken. They were to tell out that man was a sinner and that God, though, is not going to judge him by that. God will judge him not on that basis. God will accept accept him on the basis of the sin offering that has been made and the blood has been sprinkled. And that, of course, pointing to Christ. Now, that is something that I think is very important for us to see. And when you come over to the 21st chapter of the book of Revelation, and I should turn there right now and let you see this, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Now, we find that yonder in the future, God is going to bring man back into the place where he can have fellowship with him, and man will dwell with God. And that was a lovely thing the Lord Jesus said in the upper room. We always think of it, oh, he's going to come someday. Fine, that's good. But notice what he said, that where I am, there ye may be also. Don't you catch on the note there of his longing heart for fellowship with his creature, that where I am, there ye may be also. And now there can be that fellowship, the love of the Savior going out. And then they can respond with that. And I believe that that is the thing that's going to be uppermost in heaven. Now, friends, is the fact that God loves us. It'll be so obvious, manifest then. And then we'll love him. And best of all, we'll love each other. What a glorious place. I'm going to like heaven. You know why? Because everybody there's going to love me. Did you know that? Everybody in heaven's going to love me. Hallelujah. It would be a wonderful place, would it not? And that will be true of you. You can say the same thing. What a glorious, wonderful thing. Now, the tabernacle sets that forth. Now, there's a second great truth that's in the tabernacle, and, of course, that's what I emphasized in my book, that the tabernacle is a picture of Christ. And in view of the fact that I'm going to spend 
the rest of the time, both Thursday and Sunday nights, emphasizing that. I'll not emphasize it to any degree tonight other than to say this. I think that every cord in the tabernacle, every thread in the tabernacle, every color in the tabernacle, every piece of brass in the tabernacle, every tent pin in the tabernacle, everything spoke of Christ. Everything spoke of Him. And that's the reason that you have over in the 21st chapter of Revelation, and might be well to go back there again in verse 22, just to see this, for this is quite interesting. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb of the temple of it. He was the tabernacle all the time. And the tabernacle is God's portrait of Christ. And that tabernacle speaks of him, speaks of his glory, speaks of the wonder of his person. And there's nothing just quite like it. Now, may I leave that there? That's the most important in my judgment. I put it number two tonight because I am coming back to it later on. In fact, that's all we'll talk about from now on. You'll get pretty tired of that, I can assure you. So, not to worry you tonight, let me move to the third one. And it's a miniature of the one in heaven. Now, I'm not just laboring a point here at all. Moses was told to make the tabernacle according to that which he saw in the holy mount. Let me turn to the eighth chapter of Hebrews, and I'd like to read to you several verses here that I think might be helpful in revealing this to us, in the 8th chapter now of Hebrews. And if you'll turn there, well, you can follow along. I begin reading, well, let me begin at the very beginning. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle. And when he says true, he means genuine. The genuine tabernacle is in heaven, and every other one is a copy of it. This that we are given here in Exodus is a copy of the one in heaven, of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. That is, they would be Levites. Christ was the tribe of Judah. Who serve, now listen, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Now, a pattern is a pattern of something. And the reality is in heaven. I believe there's a real tabernacle in heaven. Now, let me turn over to the ninth chapter of Hebrews. Maybe I just should lift out one verse. Verse 23. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifice than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared, or end of the age hath he appeared, to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now, when Christ went to heaven, and that was before his ascension, Remember, he told Mary that morning, Don't touch me, I have not yet ascended to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. He was then the high priest on the way 
to heaven. And by the way, the book of Hebrews reveals that Christ became a high priest by his resurrection from the dead. The minute he came back from the dead, he became the great high priest for believers. Now, he was on the way there to offer his sacrifice. Now that night, he said to his disciples, touch me, feel me. What had happened? He had offered his sacrifice. Now, I believe that the Lord Jesus offered his literal blood there. Now, I don't want to labor this point. I have it in my book on the tabernacle, and if you want a correct viewpoint, you get that. And the only criticism I've ever had of my book on tabernacle that I've read of the book reviews was from a Baptist paper out of Ohio, and they really weren't critical. The reviewer just says now, he advised all the preachers to get the book, but he says, you be very careful. This man takes everything literal. Says he honestly believes that Christ offered his literal blood in heaven. He got the message. That's what I do. I believe he offered his literal blood. And they say that's crude. Well, I don't think that's crude. Then a preacher wrote me and he says, now, Brother McGee, you know, the book of Revelation says there's no tabernacle there. There's no temple for the Lord God of the land. So there must not be any there. Well, well. Now, if you would turn to the last verse of the 10th chapter, or rather the 11th chapter of Revelation, will you notice this? Now, there's no tabernacle or temple in the new Jerusalem. But there is one in heaven. Will you notice Revelation eleven nineteen? And the temple of God was opened in heaven. And this is as far as you go chronologically in Revelation. Here you are right at the door of eternity. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in the temple the ark of the testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. The tabernacle of God is in heaven. The temple is there. So I take it that Moses made a pattern down here of that which is in heaven. And that's one of the reasons that God wants you and me to see how he is approached. I believe that that tabernacle in heaven and the blood of Christ will be there throughout the endless ages of eternity to teach all of God's created intelligences, and I think they're an infinite number, and I think the book of Revelation teaches that also, that we not only are in an infinite universe, but God has infinite creatures. John says you couldn't number them, and that means there's no IBM machine that can do that. And they claim out here at Caltech, they put two of these machines together and that now they can go back billions of years and they can count all of the stars in this universe with that machine. But they can't count all of God's creatures because they says it's, they can't be numbered. I say to you that God has an infinite number of creatures and he has a message to give. And that message is not just creation that shows his power and his Godhead, but he wants to show his love. And I say this, and I don't mean to be facetious in saying this, when God shows off Vernon McGee in heaven, that'll be a demonstration of love, because all of his created universe will say, boy, he'd never made it if God hadn't loved him. And my friend, don't you laugh, you wouldn't have made it either. But you won't be there. Only on one basis. That's because God displayed his marvelous grace and he displayed his grace and his mercy to us because of the redemption in Christ and he gave Christ to die because he loved us. It'll manifest the love of God. And I say that the tabernacle down here is an evidence of the love of God to this nation. Why, the Ten Commandments scare you to death. You couldn't be saved by the Ten Commandments. Now, if you're a Seventh-day Adventist here tonight, and generally they have somebody here every Thursday night, and if you are here tonight, go back and tell them that I say that any man that says that he keeps the Ten Commandments is a hypocrite. I dare any man to stand up and say, I keep the Ten Commandments. You do not. Christ said, if you're angry with your brother, you're guilty of murder. Going to qualify? They'll turn you over to Chief Reagan tonight. Friend, you're a bunch of murder. 
We've all been angry. He says, if you so much as look upon a woman. I said that to a seven-day Adventist. Great big red-faced fella. He said, I keep the Ten Commandments. I said, I'd like to put them down on you, brother. I said, the Ten Commandments says, thou shalt not commit adultery. He says, that's right. I said, the Lord said, if you so much as look upon a woman to lust after, you're guilty of adultery. Look me straight in the eye and tell me that you're not guilty. Great big old red-faced fella, he got even redder. And he says, pshaw turned and walked out. He hadn't even answered me to this good day, and he can't answer. Don't kid yourself, my friend. You and I need to recognize there must be a righteous ground on which we as sinners can meet with a holy God. And that's one of the great purposes of this. And the other is, it's the revelation of that in heaven which will demonstrate the love of God throughout eternity. Now, I must be through. This is the fourth and the last. The tabernacle actually is a little picture of the church itself. The scripture for that, let me turn now to several verses here. First of all, I'd like to turn to 2 Corinthians 6, 1. Now, I don't know why I want to turn to 2 Corinthians 6, 1, because that's not it. It's six sixteen. Well, let me read that. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I'll be their God, and they shall be my people. The church today, believers, God doesn't dwell in this building. Don't misunderstand me. That's a pagan notion. Think God could dwell in a building. And Solomon never thought that either. But the thing is, that God indwells believers today, and that's the temple. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. But notice how Paul develops that over in Ephesians 2.22. In whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. So that the purpose of the tabernacle is to reveal to you that God is met and dwelt here with his people and thus today in the church, and they are called. The church is called today the temple of God. Now, these are the four reasons that I believe that God gave the instructions for the building of the tabernacle. It is to set forth tremendous truth as far as God is concerned. It's not just a ritual. Now, one thing more, and I'm through, and it's this. What is the difference between the tabernacle and any other pagan temple of that day? And Egypt was filled with them then. Memphis probably had over a thousand. Seems unbelievable. They had some of the loveliest temples. What was the difference between the tabernacle and the temples of that day? Just one difference, friends. That's one of the things today that's quite interesting. The critic always says, well, after all, the Egyptians had temples. They burned lamps and they wore robes and they marched around. Well, candidly, what else can you do in a ritual? You've got to burn candles and you've got to march around. If you're going to have a ritual, you just can't sit there. And so what is the difference? The difference is this. The tabernacle was supernatural. There was a pillar of cloud over it by day and a pillar of fire over it by night. God says that these are the only people that ever had any visible presence of God. We don't have in the church today. That's the reason this crowd can get by with God is dead. Well, that movement, by the way, it's dead. The movement that God is dead, it's dead now. But the thing is, how did they get by with it temporarily? Well, because... You can't bring God out. A great many people say, bring him out where I can see him. Well, that's not the way it's done, my friend. May I say to you that the children of Israel had the visible presence of God in their midst. When God was identifying them, listen to him. Who are Israelites? To whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory? They had the Shekinah glory. They had that that no other people have ever had. The visible presence of of Almighty God. And that, by the way, was a preparation for the coming of the Messiah into their men. 
because he came visibly. God manifested in the flesh. And it's no accident that John, the critic, years ago, the uh, school in Germany began high criticism, Graf Valhausen's school. They made the statement, for instance, concerning the Gospel of John, that John was writing from Greek philosophy. And then, all of a sudden, it caused a great many outstanding conservative scholars to begin to study the Gospel of John, and they found out something they'd never noted before, that if there is one Gospel that is not Greek but Hebrew, it's the Gospel of John. And only John could have said, the Word was made flesh. And the language John used is amazing. And he pitched his tabernacle among us. And that's the reason the Lord Jesus said there that day, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. What temple? They thought it was the buildings. He meant the body. God was back in the temple and in their midst visibly. Tremendous. We're going to pick up there next time, and Sunday night, I want us to see the beauties of it.